Hi everyone, joining us today is Dr. Julia Gonski, a postdoctoral research scientist at Columbia University who was featured in the Forbes 30 Under 30 list. Dr. Gonski, would you like to tell us a bit more about your background in research? Sure, yeah. So as you mentioned, I am a postdoc right now at Columbia University. I work on the ALICE experiment at the Large Hadron Collider. So this is an experimental facility, the largest collider that's ever been built. Uh, at the CERN laboratory facility, which is just outside of Geneva, Switzerland. And the reason we want to accelerate particles and collide them with a machine like this is because every time we funnel a lot of energy into a collision, we have the classic equals mc squared phenomenon. So all the energy that we funnel into that collision can turn into mass. And that's what we're after is really high mass particles because those are particles that we haven't yet discovered. So we're trying to understand all the fundamental particles and forces in the universe. We know that there are some things that are missing from our understanding. For example, dark matter, which makes up uh, a large majority of the, of the observed matter in the universe. And that's the kind of thing that we're hoping to produce in these particle collisions. And the actual research is um, building those accelerators and the detectors. So some instrumentation work, um, hardware and electronics being actually in the lab, doing that, that kind of development as well as the data analysis of, you know, this huge, you know, petabytes and petabytes of, of proton collision data. We have to mine that for these very small signals of something that could potentially be new. And so those are kind of the two branches of my research that are all focused on finding out how the universe works and what it's made of. Yeah, so I can go into all the details of that. Um, and we're good to get started? Yeah. yeah. Okay, cool. So, right, this is a, a little bit more of an in-depth uh, run through of, of the overview I just gave, looking for uncovered and unexpected new physics um, at the highest energy frontier that we can um, that we can achieve. And I'm going to go through sort of my personal avenue of um, of this research, what I've been involved in, and how I got here. So I'll start with a nice photo of the Large Hadron Collider that I was just describing. This is a, a beautiful aerial shot here of the French Swiss countryside. So the collider actually sits underground across the border of these two countries. And this is the, the machine that, the ring that provides the acceleration of two different protons going in opposite directions. Um, it's located at the CERN lab outside of Geneva, as I, as I mentioned. It is 27 kilometers long. So this is a very uh, massive machine that, that we've built. And those protons, when they're accelerating, get up to very nearly the speed of light, 99 point bunch of nines <laughs> percent the speed of light. So they're extremely high energy when they do collide into one another. And that gives us the best chance of producing these high mass, interesting new things. So in order to see if anything high mass and interesting was produced in that collision, we have to have a camera like system that sits right around that collision point and tells us everything that came out of the collision. And we do that with these dedicated detectors. The one that I work on is called the Atlas detector. There are four of these on the LHC ring. Um, this is a very massive system. Here's a, I've circled the size of a human with respect to this machine to give you a sense of just how big the scale of this detector is. It's many stories high. It's complicated. It has a lot of different subsystems that all work together. But what we're trying to do is record sort of the information about every particle that comes out of that collision. So you collide these protons, there's a spray of stuff that flies off in all directions. And these detectors allow us to um, get information about those and reconstruct all that information to see if there's anything interesting or unusual that we haven't seen before that took place and was produced in any one of those proton collisions. So the reason that we have this whole facility, the reason we're doing all this, this challenging research is because we're trying to complete the standard model. So you can think of, of this table as a sort of uh, periodic table in chemistry, but for fundamental particle physics. So all of the little circles in this table represent a particle that exists in the universe that cannot be broken up further. And they're classified into uh, various different um, areas of the model, depending on whether they have mass, whether they have charge, how they interact with one another. And this model has existed for several decades and it's been confirmed to really high experimental precision. So it's made predictions about the existence of particles that we have then discovered in these collision experiments and it's worked really well for a long time. The most, uh, the thing about the model that we need to continue this research for is that there are some things that are missing. So really notably, gravity is not explained in this model. 
I don't have to tell you that gravity exists. You certainly know about it every time you drop something and you're annoyed about it. Uh, this is explained by general relativity, which is a theory that Einstein and others propagated some decades ago. This was discovered or, or experimentally confirmed by the LIGO experiment in 2020 that experimentally detected the presence of gravitational waves, which is an incredible experiment that someone else can tell you about uh, in your next interview. Unfortunately, there is no particle explanation for gravity. It's a fundamental force. There should be a particle associated to it, and we haven't found that yet. It also does not explain dark matter, which, as I mentioned, is something we definitely know exists in the universe. We can see experimental evidence for it, uh, and unfortunately, there is no particle explanation for that either. So in doing high energy physics research and trying to look for new physics, we're trying to find explanations for these phenomena that we see in the universe that we don't understand yet. So the application of high energy collisions to solving that problem does work really well for us. The most recent example of making a discovery uh, of a fundamental particle with the LHC was the Higgs boson. This was a huge fuss that took place in 2012. It won the Nobel Prize in the following year in 2013. Um, you can see just how excited everybody was when this was first announced in 2012. It had been nearly 50 years since it was first proposed. So it was a really a long time coming. Uh, and this is a, one of the plots that represents its discovery. So this really tiny, when we're trying to discover these things, we're looking in the data for evidence of this particle and comparing it to what we expect. Uh, and so we have a hypothesis for what it will look like in the data that we can validate based on a, on a prediction, based on what the model says. And so this is showing you this slight excess in the data over the expected background that says to us, okay, there's something in the data that we didn't predict. We can test how much statistical accuracy we can have on that point. But this is how we make discoveries, is by getting really good precision on, um, on the presence of something new in the data. And so this is where I kind of come into the story. I was an undergraduate in college at the time. Uh, I went to Rutgers University in New Jersey. I uh, had the, the real privilege to have a research experience at CERN in 2013. So it was the year after the Higgs discovery, but. Uh, it was really exciting at the time. I, I was working in Higgs physics in 2012 when it was discovered, and I thought, this is incredible. Like, it, it was the most amazing thing. Everybody was so excited about it. Uh, and that really kind of lit my interest in the field of particle physics and made me want to continue on and go get a PhD in, in high energy physics research. So it's been 10 years since the Higgs discovery. Uh, you're probably thinking, you know, this huge group of scientists across the globe with this really sophisticated experiment have been up to um, really interesting and, and high level kind of research things, uh, which, is, which is usually true, which is true. There have been interesting things that have happened. Uh, there have also been some, some kind of humorous missteps. Uh, so this is a, a snapshot from an NPR article in 2016 um, when this, this tiny animal ended up chewing through some power cables, took down the whole Large Hadron Collider this way. Um, so it is there is a, a not so technical side of this research that we have to account for. My favorite quote from this article that I like to point out is that a CERN representative uh, believed the creature was a weasel and then corrected it. CERN indicates the creature may have been a marten. So we are precise in our statements about, about all kinds of things, not just uh, the fundamental particle stuff. But in actuality, what we have done in, this in those 10 years can be represented by this figure that I'm showing on this slide. So there's a lot going on here. This is a really complicated plot, and I don't want to, to kind of lose your attention in, in going through all the details. But the simplest way to explain this is that we look in the data based on certain parameterization, certain features of the data set, and we try to exclude the possibility that there is new physics hiding in that particular area. Uh, and so any place that there is a colored block on this plot is a place where there cannot be a new particle to 95% confidence. So we can't know for sure, but if, for example, I look in any point of this plot, there's a prediction for a new particle um, at 800 GeV of mass and another new particle at 100 GeV of mass, there's a dedicated paper that looked in that area of, of phase space and said, okay, there's no new particle here. So even though we haven't made discoveries, we are narrowing the places in which there can be new physics. So we're turning over more rocks and looking to see if something's there, not finding something, but we put it back and we mark it so we don't have to look there again. So we are still making progress in getting ourselves towards discovery. Uh, we've also made a lot of progress since 2012. So you can, this is a sense of just how much more um, area we've been able to look in and how many more papers we've published in that period of time. 
And I'll also point out that the orange curve um, was something that I worked on when I was uh, on the Atlas experiment as a graduate student. So this was uh, one of the analyses that went into my thesis. And as it turns out, they'll give you a PhD for this if, if you do a good job. So uh, I graduated from Harvard University in 2019 with my PhD. This is me beaming uh, in the set of my cohort that, that got PhDs the same year. Um, so this is another one of these places where it looks very sophisticated from the outside. Uh, in actuality, it looked a bit more like this. Uh, this is where it, this is how I was feeling about having a PhD maybe an hour or two later. Um, I like this picture because you can also see that I thought it was appropriate to have just like a plate of cookies for lunch. So I, go get a PhD because then you can do whatever you want and no one can tell you not to is, is my message here. So finally, now as a postdoc at Columbia, I can tell you about um, a really relevant uh, part of research that, that I've been working on that a lot of people have been working on, which is machine learning. So the new kinds of physics that we're looking for, the signals like dark matter, are really rare. It's a needle in a massive, massive haystack. And there are really sophisticated data analysis methods that let us take, um, that, that let us classify the data, take out that subtle new physics from all of the other standard model stuff that we've already seen a million times. So machine learning means that you can take what looks like an impossible problem, pulling a needle out of a really big haystack, and in a very sophisticated way, bring you a classifier that can distinguish your set of haystacks from your set of needles. And then there's one more advancement that, that I'm really focusing on in my research, which is anomaly detection. So in a regular machine learning classifier, you train the machine to figure to distinguish between needles and haystacks, but you can tell it along the way what objects are actually needles and what are haystacks. You're labeling your input data set. In anomaly detection, you just train over a bunch of stuff and you don't tell it whether it is right or wrong in its classification. So it learns what it needs to learn. And this means that it can separate outliers from a data set without any information about what those outliers look like. And this means that we can do a lot of new physics searches uh, all at once with one particular classifier. So I'd be remiss if I didn't share a, a public result with you. I know this is this this paper is going to be really high level. This is like in the, the depths of the field kind of stuff. But if you want to take a look at it, um, we did just publish uh, the first results uh, with unsupervised machine learning for anomaly detection with the Atlas experiment data set. This came out earlier in the summer. Um, so I think the best way to start learning about this research, if any of this interests you, is to just go kind of throw yourself at these papers. There's a ton of jargon. You'd have to Google you know, every single line, but it is a really nice way to figure out what kind of work is actually happening in these experiments and if it's something that interests you. So that's all I have to say. Thanks for uh, the attention. Great. Thank you so much. So I can begin our Q&A session now. Um, and so our first question for you is, um, what inspired you to pursue research in physics and instrumentation projects? Sure. So this is a uh, this is a story that I, I think about a lot. I was just mentioning to you guys maybe before the recording started that I've been interested in particle physics for a really long time. I probably got first interested in this field when I was around your guys' age, sophomore year of high school. And I was in a uh, AP chemistry class at the time. And of course, in chemistry, they tell you that the fundamental particles are protons, neutrons, and electrons. From, from the standpoint of chemistry, that's true. Uh, but I happened to be reading some like public science book. It was Brief History of Time by Stephen Hawking or something like that, that said that protons are actually made of quarks. And I thought, well, that's weird because in a science class, I was told that protons were indivisible. And I think just that realization that there's so much more to the universe than maybe what you're even told in a high school physics class really got me wondering how how far down does this go? How much more complex is this story becoming? And I, I pretty much committed to, to learning particle physics right then. I started in LHC research when I was a freshman in college. Uh, Rutgers has a really excellent group that's involved with, with uh, LHC research. And I've never looked back. I mean, it, it was, straight from college to a PhD, straight from a PhD to postdoc, and uh, I'm still doing it, still enjoying it. Got it. Yeah, our, our next question for you is, what challenges did you face when developing like the Atlas detector and its components? Many, <laughs> quite quite a few. Uh, so the, the picture that I showed of this machine that, you know, this five story high um, detector of all these different subsystems, it's hard to, 
really get the sense of how complex this machine is until you're there. So if you happen to be in Geneva, you can schedule a public tour to go down into the cavern and go see the detector. And it's these, you know, five stories high, you know, way farther down this, this underground cavern that you can even see the end of it. And every centimeter is cables and complex electronics and uh, it's all, it all has to work together. It's run by, you know, a team of, of thousands of people. And it's very unforgiving when you have a bug in, in a setup like that. It can be really difficult to find out where it is. It can be hard to fix them. We have constraints uh, of the radiation dose that happens in the cavern. We have constraints that are financial. All this research is publicly funded. And so the, the challenge is, you know, pushing this boundary of, We've never built this machine before. We've never solved this problem before. How do we do it and satisfy all of these other constraints um, in terms of spatial, in terms of getting the quality of data, not spending too much money, not enough person power. Um, and so we're always kind of doing this balancing act of, of getting what we want without um, breaking any of the other things that, that are in the detector, basically. Yeah, yeah, that sounds really interesting. Um, our um, next question for you is, uh, how can high school students get involved with research in particle physics? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I really do, uh, I do feel strongly about this. You know, for me, I, I got started in this research so early. You do not have to. I don't even know that I would recommend getting involved so early. Um, you should take some time to look around and, and see what other fields are interesting. But there are some ways, in high school, you have to be pretty, um, you have to just cold call, I would say, at the high school level. I don't think there are many official programs, but for example, we have at Columbia had some students in high school just in the area who found us just by Googling around, you know, high energy physics groups, Columbia, checking out universities in your city. And you, I am a huge fan of the cold email. You should feel completely comfortable finding someone's email address on their LinkedIn. If they do research they are interested in, you drop them an email and introduce yourself. And a lot of those connections do just work out. We are always kind of in need of, of more hands on deck and it can be really good um, experience to prep you for college applications. And then of course, once you're in college, there are a lot of programs to, to get you involved in research. Um, what I would also say is that if you have any interest in doing physics research, learn how to program. That's like the number one skill that you will be selected for in some kind of formal application. Most of the work is in Python. Um, there are like a ton of open courses that you could um, that you could use to get involved in that. And that's going to be probably the number one thing that a professor that you cold email will ask, can you code at all? Because that's, that's kind of your ticket into the door. So I think that developing a bit of Python familiarity would be really good for your prospects and starting with research. Got it. And um, our final question was that um, we remember that um, you mentioned that um, you're using unsupervised machine learning in your research, and we're just wondering how high schoolers can learn more about machine learning and its applications. Yeah, that's that's also a really good point. So that kind of goes hand in hand with the learning how to program. Machine learning uh, sounds very fancy, and and you'll see a ton of uh, you know articles in the news about AI hiring a lawyer to see if it needs to continue working, like. It's quite overblown, I think, in the uh, in the romance about it. Conceptually, a lot of the math is fairly simple. A lot of it is linear regression. Some of it, it could be, you know, the most basic neural net works on mathematical properties that you've probably learned in your classes already. So there are some really great um, websites and probably the same places you could find open courseware about learning Python, you could find for very basic machine learning. Um, there's a blog called, I think it's Towards Data Science, Dot com that I reference a lot when, when I have problems with um, with training something like a neural net. And you could find very basic code to make a couple layer neural net with some toy inputs and outputs that you could just start to program with yourself. And I would also highly recommend that. It's really interesting just as, as a general as a general thing, but that is such a good skill to have in whatever you go into. If it's physics research or computer science or I mean, everybody wants to introduce machine learning into their data analysis problem. So that's also a really nice activity to take on if you're feeling motivated. Well, everyone, thank you so much for watching our interview with Dr. Gonski. Take care and we'll see you all next time. Bye.